if you want to know more about different aspects of my science that are not covered today, um, feel free to reach out. Um, but the topic that we picked for today is, is really focusing more on how regulatory information is encoded in RNA and how can that information then be decoded uh, computationally or, or experimentally. Um, so really, I want to take a step back and I start from really the very beginning um, when I started to think about this problem. Uh, you know, we all know that all the cells in the body really share the same genetic uh, blueprint. So the diversity that we see in form and function uh, in the cellular landscape uh, really arises from which of these genes are expressed, to what extent um, basically a spatial and temporal uh, mapping of gene expression patterns really is a driver behind, behind the cellular diversity. And ultimately the idea is that there is a regulatory program um, in place in every cell that actually controls this process. Um, so, you know, each regulatory program can be cell type specific or it can be universal or broader. So uh, ultimately this is really the, the master regulatory program uh, that we are trying to understand and study. Uh, it can, for the most parts, you know, serve as a black box, but um, that's exactly what we want to uh, peer into. Uh, now we do this, you know, you can do this in the context of, um, uh, of course, healthy cells as well, like developmental processes, um, for example, or differentiation models. But uh, um, over the years, we have uh, looked at this problem more through the lens of um, cancer progression. Uh, you know, the same idea applies in that space as well, that, uh, you know, you start from a, a healthy cell that has an intact uh, regulatory program uh, that decides the gene expression patterns and gene expression landscape of the cell. And as the disease progresses, different components of this regulatory network is actually hijacked by cancer cells to achieve dysregulated gene expression patterns that are actually driving the disease. And as you go further and further away from what is normal, uh, you basically get more and more dysregulations. Um, and you know, there are basically many non-genetic uh, factors that are driving uh, cancer, for example, especially in the later stages. Uh, and my lab is specifically is more uh, interested in this, this final uh, step in progression of the disease uh, where you basically get go from a primary tumor cell to actually metastatic disease. And you're trying to understand how cancer cells uh, spread throughout the body and recolonize tumors in, in other organs. Uh, and we know that through this process, again, there's a fair bit of gene expression rep reprogramming is well actually one of the hallmarks of this process. Um, and here on the right, I'm kind of visualizing that uh, in, in a simple way by comparing primary and metastatic breast cancer tumors um, and just really listing genes that are differentially up or down regulated uh, to emphasize that there are thousands of genes um, that um, are are differentially expressed in, in a traditional sense. Uh, but really, if you take a step back and look at uh, the entirety of the gene expression landscape, is really the, the cell is, is basically transformed. Um, so we are less interested in individual events in that sense, because answer to the question, the answer to the question of, uh, you know, what are the genes that are changing uh, in the context of a complex disease like cancer um, is, is not that helpful because the answer usually is almost everything is changing depending on the resolution that you're looking at the problem. Um, so we are really instead interested in understanding what are the underlying regulatory programs that are responsible for this level of reprogramming in the gene expression landscape that we see. Now, of course, uh, historically, when we say gene expression, for the most part, folks have been focused on basically um, the steady state mRNA levels in the cell. Um, that is, uh, as you know, as you probably know, is driven by both transcription and decay. So it's a basically a, a, a this is steady state levels of mRNAs that have has become a proxy for gene expression in the field. Initially measured using microarrays, and more recently uh, with RNA sequencing. Uh, but of course, gene expression control is is a uh, is a cascade. It's a multi step cascade. Each of these steps are are very well regulated. Uh, you know, from transcription um, to RNA processing to RNA localization um, 
either to the cytoplasm or different parts of the cytoplasm or even the nucleus. And then um, uh, if it's a coding RNA, you, you can have translation and ultimately uh, the decay of RNA. So then this entire process is, is very well regulated. And this regulation happens, for example, really through the action of trans factors uh, that talk to DNA or RNA through uh, cis regulatory elements. So, you know, at the transcriptional level, for example, you have entities like transcription factors that I'm sure everyone is familiar with uh, that bind linear elements into promoters or enhancers, and they are the ones that are driving uh, gene expression of a given gene. And at the uh, post transcriptional level, for example, you have RNA binding proteins or microRNAs that similarly bind uh, cis elements on. Uh, the mRNA molecules themselves and impact their lifespan, uh, for example, impacting their uh, degradation. Now, the question that we would like to answer fundamentally, as I mentioned, is if we are given um, basically a data set of gene expression changes, uh, for example, in the context of disease or really any other context, uh, from the knowledge of how genes are changing in different conditions or in different scenarios, uh, can we figure out what are the underlying, these underlying regulatory programs that are responsible for the emergence of these patterns? So uh, this, this is not a new question. It actually goes ways back. Um, uh, it was an important question when I started grad school. It's still an important question today. Um, but I think fundamentally there were key advances in the field that I'm trying to um, cover today in, in a few slides and then link it to the kind of work that we have been doing on, in RNA structure because fundamentally the, the two questions are interlinked a bit. So uh, one of the uh, kind of, I think, greatest insights uh, in the field emerged from this understanding that, well, if um, we are talking about regulatory programs, uh, ultimately, genes that ha share the same regulatory programs then should behave similarly. Um, so the, the opposite of that becomes, if you look at genes that are co-expressed, so meaning that they sh show similar patterns of gene expression, um, in their vicinity, either in the coding sequence or promoters or enhancers, they should uh, share uh, similar binding patterns of uh, trans factors, for example. And this was really the basis of a lot of early, and even today, uh, um, uh, the basis of basically cis-regulatory element discovery uh, in the field of genomics. And uh, from very early days, there were uh, tools that were developed for, for basically taking a, a number of sequences and looking for uh, um, representations of motifs in them, as, as I'll talk about. Um, and again, some of these tools, you know, are going strong to this day. You know, the meme suite is still uh, kind of like a pillar of the community in, you know, for, for motif discovery. So this has been a long, a long standing problem. And uh, there are a lot of existing tools that for many years have focused on uh, answering it. And uh, some of these earlier attempts, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, they struggled with was really high uh, false positive rates. You know, the, the issue being that if you have a lot of sequences uh, and you're trying to look for a motif that is overrepresented in the sequences, you almost invariably uh, would find something. So um, uh, the robustness of the tools early on uh, was something that was an issue and, and over time it has got a lot better as we have been uh, uh, you know, better at kind of solving these kinds of problem and better um, exploring and, and explaining and even defining the background population of sequences. Now, when I was a graduate student, um, I met um, two postdocs in, in, in Said Tawazu's lab at Princeton who were, who were coming at this uh, from a different perspective, uh, which I really enjoyed and is really, um, I learned so much from them. They, and it has really shaped how I look at the problem uh, broadly. Um, and these two postdocs were Noam Slonem and Olivia Lamento, who have since gone to do many other things. Uh, but the problem that they were working on when I met them was actually a, a solution to this motif discovery problem. That was um, kind of like more universal approach and also quite sensitive um, and uh, uh, with very low false positive rates. That was, that was really the, the goal here. So uh, what was the solution? The solution was really to uh, kind of bring information theory into the fold and use mutual information to look at 
non-random associations between the the presence or absence of motifs as as i will talk about them and, and really explain what i mean by motif uh, uh, but you know broadly the presence or absence uh, profile of a given uh, uh, of a given element and its behavior in the data uh, you know uh, mutual information is is a very simple construct it can be uh, calculated quite rapidly which back then it was extremely important and still ex extremely important today. Um, so you can actually go through uh, quite a few elements and do really rigorous search of, uh, of, of the space, of the sequence space to be able to uh, quickly calculate um, different variations of this and do search and um, optimization. So that's actually one of the uh, uh, key uh, benefits of using mutual information. Another one is that uh, it is, uh, defined both for continuous and discrete data. So you can actually have the same underlying uh, approach to answering whether you're looking at a continuous variable, for example, log full changes, uh, or a discrete uh, measurement, like for example, cluster memberships, uh, if you have a larger data set that you have clustered. Uh, so, and, uh, and I think another aspect of mutual information that's important we'll, we'll talk about uh, a little bit is uh, uh, is also the fact that you know you can you can fit things like conditional information uh, uh, into the mix as well that uh, makes this a lot a lot more um, kind of like a, a vibrant path to to solving other um, other similar problems as well. Now to to kind of like point it out here as a few examples. Um, you know, for example, these are we're looking at three clusters of uh, genes, and and this is specific motif, as you can see, is overrepresented in this cluster. Or similarly, if you're looking at log fold changes, you see uh, there is an enrichment of, uh, of sequences at the top, so meaning that you know this motif is associated with higher expression in this data. Uh, but what is uh, important here is that uh, mutual information can also capture nonlinear um, kind of patterns. So for example, if you have a dual regulator that is simultaneously up or down regulating genes, uh, mutual information will be significant for them. Um, whereas with more traditional measures, um, that might not be the case. So uh, by and large, information theory is a very useful tool for kind of answering this problem. And um, we have over the years really um, stuck with this as, as a concept to play with in, in this space. Uh, now, the, the way that uh, FIRE, so I should also mention that the tool that does this, that was developed by uh, Noam and Livia is called FIRE. And, and the way that it actually solves the problem is uh, st starting to search the Cambridge space. Um, you as the user can define it, but I think they, they basically started with seven mers. Um, and what you do is you enumerate all possible seven mers and you use uh, mutual information to score them. Um, and then you basically sort them very quickly from um, you know, highest information to lowest. And then you can do more rigorous optimizations uh, to go from K-MERS to, and, and this is done kind of like in a greedy search, to go from a K-MER representation to a more degenerate motif representation uh, that captures multiple uh, significant um, K-MERS. Um, now, of course, I should mention that uh, the uh, the motifs here are represented kind of as uh, uh, as regular expressions, uh, and, and I'll, I'll get back to this as well. So, one of the uh, questions that I was working on as uh, as a graduate student was actually um, again like early days of applying these kinds of tools and and these ways of thinking thinking to. Uh, the explosion of data that was emerging, gene expression data that was emerging in the cancer field. And we found quite a bit of uh, information in the promoter sequence and um, what is likely to be transcriptional regulation, but also quite a bit of uh, information, regulatory information, three prime UTRs were known to be sites of post-transcriptional regulation. Um, so I started to pay more and more attention to, to kind of like that aspect of gene expression control. Um, but one thing that is important to understand is that when we go from transcription, transcription control to post-transcription control, uh, we take some of like some understanding and some some outlook on how this happens from one field to another that has really helped in some instances and and not so much in others. Um, 
you know, I, I was not the only one to do this transition. There have been plen uh, quite a few scientists in the field who, start, who started really their work in, uh, in gene expression control and transcriptional side because that was really understood to be the main uh, path of uh, kind of uh, regulating gene expression and, and more slowly gravitated towards post-transcription regulation. And uh, again, we took some lesson learned uh, from that field, um, including um, motif discovery as an example, but also, for example, really thinking about RNA binding proteins being equivalent to transcription factors. Um, and again, this helped jumpstart a lot of uh, early successes in the field, but also um, because these, uh, these are not like perfect counterparts of each other, uh, there are some aspects that that we really needed to step back and rethink uh, post-transcription control really on uh, as its own problem uh, with its own re really idiosyncrasies and uh, kind of molecular mechanisms. Uh, and one of the key aspects uh, that, that we needed to capture is really the impact of uh, RNA structure uh, on regulatory interactions. And, um, even at the time, there were many instances of RNA regulatory RNA structures. For example, uh, iron response elements are a good example, or irises are another example. Uh, there are RNAs that uh, basically they're structured and the function depends on it. It's really scaffolding RNAs. Um, there are RNAs like tRNAs that are very well structured. Uh, primary microRNAs are very structured, and that is structure impacts their function and how they're processed. Uh, basically, there's this wealth of, uh, even then, there was this wealth of information around the role of RNA secondary structure um, or ultimately tertiary structure on um, RNA level post transcription regulation. Um, but for the most part, the way that we were um, kind of like looking for cis regular terms in that space uh, was really ignoring the, the role of secondary structure. And that's certainly something that uh, we needed to account for. Uh, one way that we, we can look at how important uh, accounting for RNA structure is uh, 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 can be answered by kind of like a, a, a simple um, kind of a thought experiment. Uh, so one of, the, one of the ways that we uh, know about our RNA protein interactions is through a method um, uh, either in vivo or in vitro that is very similar to you know, how transcription factor to DNA sequences uh, by to DNA sequences are measured. Uh, so these are basically uh, affinity type uh, experiments. And what you can do is basically ask if I have uh, a data set of binding patterns of different RNA binding proteins, and this is, for example, uh, uh, publicly available data for, for some of these RNA binding proteins. Uh, if I uh, basically focus on uh, tools that find uh, sequence elements, uh, basically linear cis regulatory elements, uh, how well do I would I do in capturing the binding patterns? Um, and you know, here I'm showing you two ways of answering these questions for each of these RNA binding proteins. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for some um, for some RNA binding proteins, we do extremely well. It's very clear that they are sequence driven. For some others, not so much, despite the fact that they have uh, RNA binding domains. For example, uh, HRNAP2B1, uh, it has multiple RRM domains that have a sequence specific uh, binding. Uh, in, in reality, there is a context to this interaction. And um, actually, one of the earliest. Um, uh, examples that we found that uh, secondary structure act actually plays a role in, uh, in in the direct RNA protein interactions was actually in, uh, in the context of A2B1, where we found a lot of these motifs are embedded uh, um, in, in a structured form um, that A2B1 binds to, and, and it has a regulatory role in that context. So now, uh, now that I've kind of explained why we want to solve this problem the way that we want to solve it. Um, I want to kind of, again, go take a step back and do comparisons with the linear element um, discovery side, because um, that is something that folks have thought about and maybe that's a good starting point. Um, on, the, on the linear side, I mentioned there are different ways of look, uh, thinking about how can you represent a motif and how much uh, information that, um, kind of representation holds. Uh, there is no perfect representation. Um, any representation is a summarization of all binding patterns, so you'll lose some information. Uh, so the question is uh, for um, 
for your use case, what is the level of abstraction that you're happy with? <clears throat> Uh, for example, Fire kind of has uh, three representations. Uh, it starts with k-mers as or, or seed sequences, basically. Uh, so these are the simplest forms of uh, quote unquote motifs that you can you can work with. Uh, then extends these to regular expressions um, where uh, you basically allow for um, multiple options at different positions along the sequence um, element. And and finally, what folks really define as uh, motif, linear motifs are position rate matrices, uh, which, which, which offer more resolution in terms of uh, binding preferences. Now, the difference is that, you know, uh, basically position rate, rate matrices are, is an infinite space. You, you need some sort of heuristic to, uh, to get there. Uh, regular expression and k-mers are, uh, can be actually traversed um, computationally. So you can cover for the most part that space, and certainly the k-mers and, and uh, less so the regular expression um, side. Now uh, here we, we're starting with this understanding that these solutions really work in the linear space and we can actually find uh, motifs um, that explain um, either DNA or RNA behavior. Uh, now the question becomes, how can we extend this to, to a structure elements? What is the right way of really thinking about representing a structure elements? You know, we all understand that our RNA structure is a thing, it folds uh, onto itself and, and that can play a role, but whether these foldings are then part of a shared grammar um, across many transcripts is basically another question, right? So, and how can we actually find them? Uh, so, one way that everyone knows how we represent uh, RNA structure is this kind of uh, representation when, where every sequence is, is basically uh, accompanied by a representation of the structure uh, and using you know, parentheses or brackets. Uh, the idea being that you know, this, is, this is a central loop, for example, this is a loop, and then you have stems and, and um, these parentheses basically tell you which uh, nucleotide is interacting with which nucleotide. And uh, together, these two representations allow you to regenerate what kind of uh, secondary structure you're actually looking at. And this is kind of the output of a lot of RNA folding algorithms out there that you put in a sequence and you get the structure. Now, uh, what is important is that uh, and here, as I mentioned in the RNA folding field, you're trying to kind of like minimize energy and uh, kind of solve a different problem, in, uh, biophysical problem in terms of how do you go from here to here. But in the motif discovery field, we're trying to take many representations of sequences and ask whether they uh, have matches to potential um, uh, secondary structures or not. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, the case that the, the the structure we are looking for is, is the uh, most energetically favorable um, uh, conformation of that RNA, if you will, uh, but that doesn't really preclude it from being a functional element. Uh, so in our approaches, we, we kind of stayed away from uh, RNA folding, but uh, as, as we'll discuss today, that's, you can certainly always bring it in um, um, and kind of like add it as a component to, to, um, to answer in this problem. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how can we actually represent uh, secondary structures in a data structure that allows us to really work with uh, quickly in the uh, in silico, basically. Um, so one of the uh, uh, key uh, kind of like concepts here that really helped us and the field as a whole to really answer this question is is basically context-free grammars. Uh, you know. Uh, I don't really have a lot of time to go into this. This is borrowed from uh, linguistics. Um, I'm just gonna uh, basically present the two versions of this that are useful for today. You know, something like a regular language, you have elements that uh, are constant and then you can uh, basically uh, link these constant elements together uh, to, to form longer and longer phrases. Um, so for example, in the, uh, in the regular language, you can create a kamer uh, or a regular expression even. Uh, basically the idea is that you start from nothing and you keep adding you know, C, A, G, U, and then you get a kamer. So each one uh, is a rule that works on the previous rule and creates a new um, phrase and stringing them all together gives you a kamer. <clears throat> 
now with RNA structure, we want something that can capture not that just not just the sequence, but also the information around about what goes with what in, in the secondary um, structure space. And the system needs a little bit of memory. So for example, you need to, when you see this uh, A, you need to know that it goes with this U and these two are linked. So if I change this, I need to change that uh, for the structure to remain constant. Um, and so this little bit of memory is actually captured in, in context-free grammars um, where uh, you can basically start with uh, what you had in regular language uh, where, you know, for example, here we are recreating this loop here by just adding a G, it's kind of a K-mer. But then after that, we can actually add uh, uh, elements to both sides that captures the fact that these, go, these two actually go together. So, you know, U and A go together and you go together and G and C go together. And uh, again, running through all of this will recreate this um, representation for you. So uh, basically context-free grammars are a data structure, provide a data structure that allows us to very quickly represent um, kind of like secondary uh, structures and sequences together in one place and really enable uh, kind of like motif discovery in, in, the, in the structural um, space, if you will. Honey, quick uh, question. So sure. what was that like linear versus polynomial um, that you had in the previous slide? Uh, basically, it's uh, it's basically growth um, uh, in terms. So basically, the the uh, the length basically glows linearly as you go through, but here it can go poly polynomially. Basically, right. yeah. thank you. Uh, so uh, one of the first tools to actually uh, use this, I mean, the uh, using context-free grammars to 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 represent our structure actually goes back to the um, '90s, uh, I believe. Um, one of the first tools to actually take advantage of it to, to do um, motif discovery in some sense in the structural space was, was this paper. Um, uh, it really had a profound effect on myself when I was a graduate student and I, and I read this. Um, so I will, I will certainly encourage you to take a look at it if you have time. Uh, so it's basically a tool called RNA Promo uh, where they showed that uh, you can actually take advantage of uh, context-free grammars, and specifically uh, the variation of them that are stochastic context-free grammars to actually learn uh, what are the uh, shared secondary structures uh, in, um, uh, in kind of sequences that you know are, uh, again, like shared regulatory elements. Um, the, uh, this is very similar to beginnings of uh, kind of uh, the linear sequence space as well, where, you, where we were starting with a few genes that um, we knew that are behaving similarly on, um, in certain conditions, and we knew that they need to have uh, similar sequence elements, and that's really how the search started. Here we are doing a kind of uh, tracking the same progression uh, for, for the RNA structure space as well. So this is, this is really where we started, being able to find these uh, uh, structure elements uh, using and uh, representing them basically using a stochastic uh, context-free grammars. So uh, I said all of that to say that basically in the in the uh, uh, in the structural uh, element space we can use context-free grammars to actually represent um, you know any variation of the linear um, space like you know both k-mers, regular expressions, or even um, uh, position weight matrices um, in the um, uh, in the kind of like the visualization space, you have uh, kind of the sequence of structure duo, which I talk about. You have these, uh, you know, secondary structure representations. You can use, um, again, uh, degenerate sites where you can have uh, multiple options. This is basically equivalent of regular expression uh, as a schematic. And ultimately, you can use context-free grammars uh, to basically re represent all of this. Um, in, in silico, ultimately. Okay, so uh, how do we take advantage of this? So th the way that I want to think about, uh, I want you to really think about this is that, uh, you know, context-free grammars uh, can basically play the role of kamers in the original problem, motif discovery problem that we were trying to solve. Um, so when kamers um, were basically the seed sequences that we used for uh, for linear uh, motif discovery. Uh, basically, context-free grammars can also serve a similar role. Uh, the difference, the major difference, is that the the search space is uh, substantially larger, uh, so we cannot enumerate all possible um, 
seed uh, uh, context free grammars, if you will, we need to somehow define them, uh, what we mean by, by seed structure elements. Um, but, but in some sense, we are starting with uh, some sampling of uh, seed structure elements in the massive space of uh, structure elements. And again, we, we try to put constraints as, as, as you would imagine on, on what this search space would look like. Uh, but you know, the idea is that uh, each of these elements will capture some sequence and some structure restrictions. Um, and again, initially you can start with uh, actual, um, you know, came representations embedded in this, in this sequence. So for example, this is really a, a you know, GAG, uh, you know, sequence embedded in this structure. The idea being that if you know these two and you know the structure, you know these two, right? That's, that's kind of how information is shared. Um, and so you, if you have this, and of course you can further generalize this to uh, kind of like similar to regular expressions uh, where you can have multiple options in each of these positions. But, but this can be basically our seed representation. And if you can start with a large sampling of these um, um, along this space, again, um, your computational power uh, dictates how large this space can be. Um, and based on that, how complex these seeds can be. Uh, initially, you know, you can start with like a, a certain limit on uh, the, the length of the stem or the loop or how much information is in the sequence content uh, that will actually show examples of uh, today. So once we have generated uh, kind of like representations of these Cs, again, very similar to K-mers, uh, we can use, uh, again, context-free grammars to scan sequences for matches very quickly. Uh, and do what we did for K-mers. You know, if we see a match, so for example, here I'm showing you this schematic uh, where we implemented in, in our tool, uh, which we call teaser for structural element discovery. It's basically uh, uh, an extension of FHIR that was developed by Noam and, and Olivier to the RNA structural space. Uh, and this was a work that I did uh, in collaboration with a close friend of mine, um, Hamid Najaf Awadi, who has a computational lab at McGill. Um, um, who I encourage you to check out is really doing amazing work these days as well. Um, but we worked on this as graduate students together. Um, and we basically uh, developed teaser to uh, be similar to fire, but be extended to, um, to the RNA structural space as well. So the idea is that once you have definitions of these seeds, you can uh, enumerate them and ask whether they're present or absent in a given sequence. And then you have some measurements similar to gene expression, uh, as, it, as we talked for fire. Here we are looking at RNA stability, for example. Uh, since RNA stability is something that's post transcription regulated, uh, um, it's a good example to have. So for example, this element is very clearly associated with uh, destabilization in, in RNA. And uh, again, you can capture this using mutual information. Uh, in practice, uh, the, 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 the search algorithm is very similar to what happens in FHIR as well. Uh, again, you start with these structural seeds. Uh, you use mutual information to capture their association with the data. Uh, and then you pick each of them. And then you do a, a more local greedy search around that seed uh, for better and more complex representation. So you can go to more complex representations from, from uh, basically a K-mirror representation to more regular expression representation. And along that path, you can also make changes to the structure as well, uh, which again, I think Matt today will, will uh, give you some examples of. Uh, so once you have a, a more archetypal um, uh, kind of uh, representative of, of uh, an element, kind of like the best camer, if you will, of, um, of a, a structural element, then you can basically create a bag where, you know, the, the way that you can think about a, 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 a regular expression representation of uh, a linear motif is basically a bag of camers. Uh, so in the same way, you can put together a bag of uh, context-free grammars that look similar uh, to basically create your representation of, uh, of a structure element in RNA. And so uh, that's basically uh, how our first attempt to solve this problem uh, actually took shape. Hey, so I got a quick question. Sure. Uh, can, can you give us an intuition about um, like how often do you actually see matches? Let me, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me 
that on, on the one hand, if you choose a context, like a specific, like you know, context free grammar, the you know the odds of being able to you know match it in any sequence is, is pretty pretty small, right? But on the other hand, you have a lot of you know uh, different context free grammars, and you have a lot of different sequences. So, so there's you know that there's an explosion of options in that sense too. So um, so I, I'm kind of like not you know I don't have the intuition, you know what's going to be, for example, what's the what does it mean for your false false positive rate? Good, very good question. So actually, uh, I think Matt will will talk about this. Uh, it really goes back to which space you start your sampling from. Uh, how you define this space is actually kind of problem specific because you want to capture seeds that are not present in everything and not absent in everything. You can define how much information you want it to have and how many instances you want it to have in that data set on average that you're starting with. So, so sequences, so for example, if, you have, if you're searching in very long sequences, then these need to be a lot more specific to begin with. But if you're looking for, you know, in shorter sequences, you can make them more and more degenerate from the get-go. Uh, so it, it really is problem dependent in, in some sense. Uh, Thank you. Unfortunately. Uh, so I'm going to spend that, uh, the, the final few minutes to talk about where we applied this um, early on. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, you know, for a second talk, we'll, we'll hand off to, uh, to Matt and um, Mehran to talk about where we are with kind of with this, with this problem today. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm interested in metastasis uh, as a scientist, and uh, uh, one of our go-to models for answering uh, questions about metastasis are these really nice uh, in vivo selection models, where we basically start with an established cell lines, which we call the parental line, that are often polymetastatic. Uh, one of our favorite models is actually the MDAMB231 model that was generated by um, John Masaki's group at, uh, um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, where basically, it started, they started with this um, uh, cell line, and then they selected this line in mice for higher metastatic potential. Um, and they derived, for example, the MDLM2 model, which is uh, uh, substantially more metastatic to the lung. And LM2 stands for long metastatic round two. So basically two rounds of selection in the lung gives you the LM2 model. Um, and you know, um, both the Masaga lab and other labs and including ours have over the years generated a lot of these matched models of metastasis. And because they're really isogenic, but phenotypically very different, it's a very good model, matched model to, to really explore uh, molecular drivers of, uh, of metastasis. And what is really important is that even in this like short selection going from the parental to the, M the LM2 models, uh, again, you see broad changes in the gene expression uh, landscape of the cell. Again, like even a short selection like this really brings about all the uh, um, regulatory modulations that you need to see. So of course, there is like a ton to learn from these models in terms of gene expression control. But at the same time, since they have more or less that, you know, they're isogenic, it's also a very, uh, you know, nice controlled background in that sense. So uh, one of the one of the first um, kind of like measurements that I did as a postdoc um, was to use a metabolic labeling of RNA to measure RNA decay rate in these models. I actually developed this this method um, in in grad school. There are quite a few groups that around the same time uh, did similar measurements. Um, the, with the goal of trying to measure RNA decay rate transcriptome wide. And the idea is that you feed the cells like uridine and, you know, which gets more or less seamlessly incorporated into RNA. And uh, at, um, uh, you know, this is basically the pulse period. And then you remove thiuridine from the media. And then you can basically, through a chase period, measure how much thiuridine you see in a given RNA. And that tells you kind of the stability of that RNA. So that's basically the idea. So I did this experiment with uh, poly and highly metastatic cells in biological quadruplicates. So we actually had uh, really nice data comparing poly and highly metastatic cells. And this is the results of that data. Uh, so again, uh, quite a few genes that are up or down regulated as you go from a poly metastatic state to a highly metastatic state. Um, um, and here I'm showing you two major clusters as you, you know, it's a comparison. So there's really two main clusters you're interested in. Those are stabilized in highly metastatic cells, um, meaning that they have like lower decay rate and 
those are destabilizing high level static cells. Uh, we had some intuitions about what's going on here. My um, uh, uh, my postdoc advisor, Soel Tavazi, actually had done a lot of work in this area. Uh, he was one of the pioneers of looking at microRNAs as regulatory factors in, in cancer. Um, and we had some intuitions about like what what factors could be responsible for this, but not much known was about this, this set. And this is what we tried to answer, not necessarily using a structural element discovery, but we looked for both for linear and structural elements using fire and teaser. And out of that came uh, this, uh, what we call uh, basically RNA structural element, a structural uh, RNA stability element, sorry, the S stands for structured. Uh, here I'm showing you this element as a generic stem loop. This is just to show that it's a fairly G series stem loop element. Um, and what uh, teaser actually shows is one a, a representation of this along with a mutual information and Z-score, uh, but also gives you, a, a, generates a heat map that tells you where things are actually enriched or where things are depleted. So for example, if you look at transcripts that are destabilized, uh, with respect to those transcripts that have these uh, SRIC elements, uh, we see a very significant overlap. Uh, you can actually calculate the p-value for this using hypergeometric distribution and you know, define a minus log of this p-value as an enrichment score and use it to draw a heat map. Um, on the other side, in the background, uh, for other transcripts, uh, SRIC overlaps are actually depleted, um, uh, and that gives you an enrichment, an enrichment score of negative eight, and you know you add that to your um, uh, to your heat map. So basically, you, you get this like heat map representation of where these elements are along the uh, input data as well, in addition to the fact that it's just a non-random pattern of presence or absence. And uh, to give you some instances of these elements that we find, uh, you know, again, very G series just some loop structures um, and that, that are overrepresented in these uh, destabilized elements. Um, what I showed you in the previous uh, slide was basically in the uh, um, kind of like discrete space. I grouped them into destabilized um, and not. Whereas in reality, you can actually run this in the continuous space. Uh, going from a stable to unstable with um, substantially more uh, bins. Uh, so each of these bins have about 350 transcripts in them. And uh, again, as you see, there's a very nice uh, and significant enrichment of uh, these SRSC elements on the left and uh, they're depleted on the right. So this is exactly the kind of pattern that we would expect to see for, for functional elements. Uh, and of course you can, uh, you know, if, if uh, an element is associated with RNA stability changes, you would expect it to also be associated with uh, gene expression changes. And that's exactly what we saw, that this element is enriched among the genes that are downregulated. Uh, we can look at it in this heat map context, but you can also look at it, uh, basically look at the density plots. Uh, again, uh, this is the background and this RSE regulon defined as a set of transcripts that carry these elements, uh, they show a significant shift uh, to the left. So uh, this, this kind of answers the first question that we always want to answer when we go from transcriptomic measurements to some understanding of uh, what the underlying uh, cis regulatory elements are. Uh, the, the second part is, uh, uh, is also important. Uh, so what are the trans factors that are actually um, talking to these elements is, is really forms the regulatory mechanism of gene expression control. Um, over the years, we have developed a couple of ways of answering this, either computational or experimental. Uh, experimentally, you can uh, basically do variations of bait IP uh, mass spectrometry, or more recently, genetic screens uh, to be able to be able to find factors that are actually interacting with this um, with these elements that you have found, um, or you can actually do this um, uh, computationally, or at least attempt to do this computationally. And this is based on again co-expression analysis. The idea being that if you have a regulator that um, sits upstream of a regulon and your regulon has a given expression pattern or RNA stability pattern in this, in this example, uh, you, would, you would expect the regulator to be co-expressed uh, if it's an activator and uh, anti-correlated if, uh, if it's a repressor. Um, this is a very simple paradigm. Uh, it doesn't always hold true, but uh, 
sometimes does. Um, actually, in my experience in the RNA binding protein field, it, 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 it's a uh, it's a pretty good proxy and starting point. So this is where we start usually to, to be able to find trans factors, uh, but not always successful. So for example, if this is your target regulon, you'll find RNA binding proteins that are correlated or anti-correlated in terms of their patterns in, uh, in existing data sets. Uh, so we did this analysis for the uh, SRIC regulon uh, that I showed you was associated with RNA stability. And we found three potential RNA binding proteins that, um, that could be responsible for, um, for the function of this element. And one of them we could actually validate using knockdown profiling. So we found uh, this protein called TARBP2, uh, when, which when you knock down, you actually see an upregulation in this um, in this regulon. Uh, again, we can also look at the density and the shift to the right in this case. Uh, and this shift is actually due to higher stability of this regulon, as you would expect, because we are looking at stability element. And if we uh, overexpress TARBP2, um, we see the opposite effect. So that's very clear. Um, uh, kind of like one-to-one -one correspondence between TARBP2 and the activity of this element. Uh, and finally, to really prove that there is this direct interaction, uh, you can take advantage of a method like CLIP uh, that tells you where the RNA binding proteins are sitting transcriptome-wide. Um, so for, for those of you who don't know CLIP, it's basically equivalent of ChIP-seq for RNA binding proteins. Um, it actually uh, relies on UV cross-linking, so it's a lot more precise and gives you like nucleotide resolution of RNA binding protein, RNA interactions transcriptome wide. Uh, but you can basically look at where TARBP2 sits and ask whether they uh, actually form these structure elements that we were looking for. And the answer is uh, by and large, yes. So uh, TARBP2 clearly binds um, elements that that are similar to our definition of SRSC elements. Um, and this wasn't actually too surprising in the sense that TARBP2 is actually a double strand non binding protein. Um, but this role that we found for it was actually a, a non canonical role for, for this, um, uh, for this RNA binding protein. In its canonical form, it actually interacts with Dyson and Argonaut and is a uh, component of a, a, a risk complex machinery. But we also show that it directly um, interacts with RNA as well uh, and has a, a regulative function. And we had a follow-up paper um, a few years ago that really looked more closely that, um, at this problem. But what I wanted to say is that like all of, all of this pathway of metastasis that is modulated by tar 2 that we found really for the first time in the context of uh, breast cancer metastasis uh, was really initiated by teaser. Really, how 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 we went from transcriptome-wide measurements uh, of RNA stability to kind of like a new understanding of how gene expression is regulated uh, in cancer cells, but also just broadly. So this is uh, basically where things were uh, around the time that I started my lab, um, and over the years there have been uh, a few changes in the field that has um, also modified how we are approaching the problem. And these are basically what are going to form the foundations of the next talks that, that you'll hear about. Um, one thing uh, to point out is basically in recent years, uh, thanks to advances to RNA structure probing, we actually now have tools that tell us what RNA um, looks like in vivo even, um, certainly in vitro, but even in vivo. And uh, there are a number of uh, transcriptomic tools that answer these kinds of questions. For example, DMS MapSeq uh, that was uh, developed by uh, initially a version of it by Sylvie Ruskin uh, in Jonathan Weissman's group, and IC Chef with, by Ryan Flynn and uh, Howard Chang's group. Uh, they basically both of these uh, work based on RNA modifications that are a function of how exposed the RNA is. So they basically label different nucleotides in RNA based on whether they are part of a loop or a bulge or part of a, a stem. So you can use them to kind of get a sense of the structure of the RNA. Um, and uh, that is basically what prompted the project that, um, in part prompted what the project that Matt did. Um, basically that uh, turning teaser into pi teaser that can also incorporate other source of information as well into not just sequence information as part of the search space. Uh, and also uh, really just make something that's a lot more, uh, you know, Pythonic and, and modular than, um, than what we had initially. Uh, another area that uh, 
really the, the field has gone into um, the entire uh, gene expression regulation is really the advances in deep neural networks and how they are reshaping how we model gene expression control and cis regulatory elements. Um, uh, you know, starting from, um, you know, deep bind that I showed you some results from earlier, but larger and larger models, um, both in terms of parameter space or even input sequence uh, are being used to look at gene expression control, both at, at the transcriptional level as well, uh, but also at post-transcriptional level. Um, so what Mehran will talk about today is that how we uh, try to bring context-free grammars um, to basically deep neural networks um, by giving the model basically the, uh, um, the rules and let it learn the grammar, basically. Um, and, and, and he'll talk about that. So this will allow us to, uh, to basically take um, what is now the state of the art for defining regulatory elements, um, not necessarily based on motif representations, but based on model dissections. Um, and there are quite a few tools out there that, um, um, and, you know, uh, including the ones that Anshul Khundaj's lab at Stanford have, have, um, have developed uh, that you can actually use to interrogate these kinds of models. And uh, uh, from these models, you can actually learn what are the uh, sequence uh, preferences um, that drive the data. And we are trying to, we have tried to bring this uh, into the, um, the kind of, like, this is our structural dimension into these kinds of uh, uh, processes as well. And I think with that, I'm gonna stop here. Um, and uh, I acknowledge both Mehran and Matt, we're gonna to talk today, um, but also everyone else who, who has um, a, in my, who has been in my lab and also kind of contributed to these projects. Hani just gave a great overview of how he approaches the problem of finding cis regulatory elements uh, by using both computational and experimental methods. And I will elaborate on one angle of this that we implemented in my teaser project. As Hani mentioned, it's a development of this previous work that started with uh, FIRE with gamer discovery, then teaser with structural C discovery. And so this is the current state of the art thing we have in the lab. Uh, do, give me one second. Yeah, to specify the problem, our goal here in this case is to identify RNA secondary structure and motifs that explain differential measurement of interest. So Hani used mRNA stability a lot as an example, and I will be using splicing patterns, but really the goal is to make a generalizable framework that can take any differential measurement. The challenges associated with this are that the space of possible RNA secondary structure motifs is extremely large, and our understanding of these cis regulatory rules are pretty vague. So to give you a fr framework of what our solution is, uh, the program by teaser takes any differential measurement between two conditions as an input, uh, complemented by the set of sequences that we used for these measurements. And it outputs a ranked list of RNA secondary structure motifs that could explain this differential signal. You can also optionally provide RNA secondary structure probing data that Hani has mentioned and that I will talk about more later. So you have a pretty good idea of overall how this program would work conceptually. So I will be focusing more on the details of implementation and the decisions we had to make along the way than on the conceptual part. So I'll start with the seed selection. So as you know, the overall space of RNA secondary structures is pretty much infinite. There are any number, any kinds of them. And since we want to actually try some number of them one after another, we have to put some constraints. And the most obvious constraints are size constraints. So by starting with just short seeds of between approximately eight to 20 nucleotides long, we can reduce the search space to already 10 to 11 uh, seeds, something like that. And then additionally, we put uh, information content constraints, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. And this way we can actually start with a uh, horse grain search using approximately 1 million of short informative seeds. So to go to algorithm of how we choose seeds, we basically just generate 
all possible seeds of a given size, and we filter them based on the information content criteria, we have two key criteria implemented. One of them is number of meaningful bases, so the ones that are not n. And the second criteria is restrictiveness of the seed, so probability that sequence of the same length matches the seed. So what I mean by that is a seed can be too permissive or too restrictive. If you take a seed that only consists of n bases, it describes any single sequence of the same length. So it's not specific enough and doesn't really tell us anything. On the other side, if we take a long seed where every single nucleotide is defined by a specific base, uh, this seed can only cover a very small number of sequences. So it's too specific and doesn't cover enough of the search space. So we want to say between, so start with seeds that are somewhat informative, but not too big. And this is what this information content criteria is addressing. So with the default parameters we use, we start with approximately 1 million of seeds. And the package provides Python script for generation of such seeds and also a set of pre-compiled seeds that we use by default in most projects. I put URLs here because I believe the presentation will be shared after the talk. So anyone interested, feel free to visit uh, these links. Once we generate- Matt, Matt, a quick uh, yeah. sort of uh, question for you. Uh, for the people who are just you know, joining us for the main talk uh, and you know, might not have been in the primer, could they just you know, in 30 seconds say, you know, what, what do you mean by a seed in the context of your problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll go back here. So I will use two terms. I'll use the word seed and the word motif. So the word motif is some kind of definition of this regulatory element. Uh, the word seed is we literally start with just small secondary structure, which consists of a stem and a loop, or maybe two stems and two loops in between them. So these we use as kind of extension of k mirrors to identify the structure motifs. And then in the end of the program, I'll show that we group similar seeds together and we call a group of them a motif. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so once we've chosen a set of seeds, we go to the step where we want to search, to do search, identify matches of each individual seed and all the sequences. This step is very slow because we have a lot of seeds and a lot of sequences. So in order to do it in a computationally feasible time, we had to come up with some high performance solution. And this slide, I'm just showing you the tricks we use to achieve that. So the first ingredient is context-free grammars that Hani has mentioned. Context-free grammars is a great way to uh, encode, to describe secondary structure for a computer, uh, and also to make it possible to search for RNA secondary structure quickly in a sequence. The second ingredient we use is Numba. It's a compiler for Python functions. So instead of running the whole code as default Python interpretive code, we pre-compile certain function classes and this can provide us with a large speed up. So on the right, this is not relevant to the specific problem, but I'm just illustrating that uh, Numba, such compiler for Python can uh, increase speed of computation by more than two orders of magnitude in certain cases. And so to specifically implement such seeds, uh, to implement the seeds, we use two core classes. So Numba uh, as a Python compiler is great for fast checking, but it doesn't have wide functionality. So we use one class that only can do one thing. It can search for a seed in a sequence and it does it very, very fast. And we use a second class, which is this layer of interface between the user and the rest of the program to this number class uh, that is written in regular Python. This class uh, can be used for input, output, printing, visualizing, and doing all kinds of interface operation with seeds. So uh, here I'm talking about all these matching of seeds and sequences. And I just want to show an example here. Uh, so here there's an example seed it has structure shown here and the sequence shown here. I want to emphasize that sequence does not only have four specific uh, nucleotides, it also has some degenerate nucleotides shown by N, which provides larger, uh, area, larger number of sequences the seed can cover. 
And here there's an example of a match. So this sequence can potentially form a secondary structure represented by the seed while also matching the sequence. So now we have a number of seeds. We have some initial set of sequences and we want to do the search for seed matches in these sequences. And if we show each seed here as a row, and then within each row, one cell is a sequence, we can show sequences that match the seeds by black squares. And this makes these uh, match profiles that are just binary vectors for each individual seed and whole set of sequences we use. We can use, when I say set of sequences, it can be transcriptome, it can be set of exons, anything really. I can say transcriptome for simplicity. So again, at this step, we are trying to find sequences that match the seed of interest. And we do it for each individual seed uh, among the starting set. So just to emphasize again, this step is the slowest part because we have a lot of sequences, a lot of seeds. And that makes the program run slow. The good news is that pretty often a research lab studies mostly one organism. And in this case, seed profiles, these matching uh, binary vectors can be reused between different projects. Uh, so we really wanted to add this functionality where we can run the program once for a certain set of sequences and then reuse such match profiles in the future for other projects. The one problem though is that since there are a lot of seeds and sequences, if we just write these profiles in any conventional way, such as tables or anything else, they take a lot of space on the computer. So it's not really feasible. So we had to come up with a method to encode the seed profiles in a heavily compressed way. And here on this slide, I am showing how we implemented that. Uh, in the middle here, there's a match profile kind of like the ones I've been showing before. For any single sequence, the only information we really need to know is if it does or doesn't match the given seed. This information is just a binary variable, yes or no. And therefore it can be encoded not even by a byte, but by just one bit. And therefore we can encode this vector for n sequences in n divided by eight bytes. Now, since we have a lot of these profiles, some files might get corrupted and we want the machine to know that. So we add two additional things. First, we add four bytes with profile length. So how many pro bytes does the program need to read? And in the end, we write MD5 checksum an additional 16 bytes to make sure the profile was read correctly. Uh, so such thing. Uh, so yeah, so we implement this with a Python struct module and then the size of such individual compressed profile depends on the number of sequences used. But for example, for human genome, which is about 20,000 genes, such compressed profile takes about two and a half kilobytes. So we can save profiles for 1,000 seeds in only 2.5 megabytes, which at this point makes it feasible. So this is again, mostly for the purpose of running this program once for any given organism or set of sequences, and then reusing these match profiles later. So now I want to talk about the in vivo probing. So I've been mentioning this uh, searching for seed match. So when we say a seed matches sequence, we say that sequence can potentially form secondary structure that is described by the seed. We don't actually know if it does form a structure, but we hypothesize that it can. We can actually check if it does form this structure in vitro, in vivo, or in silico. And as Hani mentioned, within the last five years, these methods for in vivo secondary structure probing have been developed. The two most popular methods are DMS seek and shape. They are pretty similar conceptually. In this slide, I'm showing the scheme for DMS seek from the original paper. Uh, you use this highly toxic chemical, DMS, that preferentially binds, well, preferentially interacts with the uh, flexible or rather unpaired nucleotides in the RNA. And then you take this RNA and you proceed with the library preparation. And depending on which reverse transcription enzyme you use, uh, DMS 
it doesn't really help the sugar transcription enzyme do its job. And it causes either truncations or mutations of the reverse transcription uh, process. So like cDNA will be either mutated or truncated. We use these mutated or truncated reads uh, for further library preparation and sequencing. And we can count them in the end in the sequencing data that are shown here by these red dots. And basically the data in the end looks like this profile where for each nucleotide, we have a number how often this nucleotide is mutated. And that shows you approximately how often this nucleotide is unpaired within the population of RNA species. The second popular method that's called IC shape is very similar conceptually. It uses a different uh, molecule to do such probing. This molecule is less toxic. In the end, the data you get is conceptually pretty similar. It's also a proxy for how op open each nucleotide is. And it comes as this profile, one number per nucleotide. So how do we apply this data to our motif search? So we found a match of a certain seed, and we hypothesize that the sequence can form secondary structure we described. Now, we pretty much take the DMS or shape data and overlay it on top of this sequence. And here I'm showing it in these colored nucleotide circles. The darker a nucleotide is, the more mutations we have in this DMS seq data, the more open or unpaired this nucleotide is in the population. So here you can see that actually the nucleotides that we predict as unpaired are generally darker than the nucleotides within the stem. So this does not contradict our hypothesis that this sequence form the structure shown here. So we call such comparison a pass. So when we go back to these whole seed match profiles, we can use DMS or shape reactivity profiles to filter out the matches that are possible just based on the sequence, but unrealistic uh, if we look at in vivo secondary structure data. So where we see the conflicts of the predictions and the in vivo data. This does not have to be restricted to just in vivo profiles. We can use in vitro profiles. We can even use the in silico secondary structure folding, which is a less favorable option, but currently far more accessible than in vivo probing data. So at this step, we filter out the matches that are unrealistic. And now with that, we go to a step where we discretize the expression profiles and calculate mutual information. Hai has shown it with this beautiful scheme on the right. Uh, we start with some kind of input measurement that can be expression stability, anything really. Uh, I visualize here by a McKenna plot we discretize such measurement by bins shown here uh, and end up with a discrete measurement vector. And this is really the point where we can estimate how good a certain seed is for explaining our differential signal. So we calculate mutual information uh, mentioned before between the seed profile and this discrete vector of measurement of interest. And this mutual information value is our estimate of how good the seed is in explaining the signal. So we can do this fairly quickly for all the seeds we, we started with. And then we can rank the list of seeds by the mutual information value, assuming that the higher the seed is in the list, the more likely it is to be explanatory. Obviously we don't wanna proceed taking all the seeds within the list, we want to, oops, uh, we want to set, take some limited set of significant seeds. So we use a binary search algorithm. Uh, so for any single mutual information value, we can calculate the p-value associated with it by doing permutation tests, calculating mutual information many times for shuffled vectors. And based on these permutation tests, we can search uh, do binary search for a good threshold with a certain value of FDR uh, and only take the top number of seeds uh, with the highest p-values, I mean, lowest p-values. 
And so at this point, we have a small number of significant seeds. Once we have a significant seed, we want to optimize it. And the logic behind it is that in the very beginning, I mentioned we do a coarse grain search of the whole RNA secondary structure space. We can't possibly do a fine grain search. So whatever good seeds we find are probably suboptimal. There's probably some local maxima close to the seed. So we are trying to find this local maxima by iteratively improving the seed. So we take any single nucleotide within the seed and consecutively mutate it and try to find uh, uh, modified versions of the seed that have higher inf mutual information value. We don't have to only change the nucleotides within the seed. We can also uh, add seeds, add nucleotides to the end of the seed, so prolonging it and uh, adding information there, basically, and also do it in an iterative way, trying to find seeds with higher mutual information value. So every single seed within this short significant list is being optimized this way. And once we optimize it, we often observe that the seeds that are highly optimized are actually, many of them are similar to each other. They have similar structure, similar uh, sequence and similar profile. And they probably represent the same rules in a slightly different way. So it makes sense to cluster these seeds together. And so here is where the word motif comes. So here we call a cluster of seeds that are similar to each other, a motif. So such motif is the final output of the program. Uh, for any single set of differential measurements, we identify a motif that could explain such difference in the signal. So now I want to talk about one application we use it for. Uh, we use teaser to study to study splicing in metastatic cancer. As Hani mentioned, metastatic cancer is one of the key model systems in the lab. So we analyze cassette exones that are differentially spliced between highly and poorly metastatic cells. And we used PyTeaser to identify motifs that would explain such difference. The top motif we identified is this motif shown here. It's very CG reach element. We termed it SSE as structural splicing enhancer. Here there's a diagram that shows that this motif is highly enriched on one side of the spectrum if we rank the exons by their relative splicing score. Uh, we wanted to know what transfactor could bind this motif. So we performed an RNA pull down. We use an RNA that contains several copies of such motif. And we followed this by mass spectrometry. And the top hit in the mass spec samples was SNRPL1. Uh, it's a part of spisosome, but it's not known to bind anything like the element we found. So we wanted to know if SNRP1 actually has preference for motifs like SSE. So to do that, we performed RNA bind and seek in vitro experiment. It's an experiment where you basically mix a bunch of RNAs together and then sequence uh, trying to see which RNAs are bound by the factor preferentially. So on the right here, there's a diagram where what I wanted to show you is that we try to perturb the motif in different ways and see how it changes SNRP1 binding to the motif. So if we, so there's a wild type on the left here. If we modify the sequence in the way that preserves the structure, for the most part, the SNRP1 binding preference stays the same. If we disrupt the structure, the binding uh, drops significantly. So you might think structure matters and sequence doesn't. It's not quite the case, because if we also perturb the loop sequence, we get even, even worse drop in binding affinity. So the outcome here is that basically SNRP1 has strong preference for motifs like the one we found. And both sequence and structure matter in this case. We proceeded to validate the SNRP1 binds structures that look like SSE in vivo by doing cross-linking and immunoprecipitation experiment, which is pretty much a gold standard in this field. And uh, further, we validated that SNRP1 is driving cancer metastasis by 
doing mouse experiments where we knocked down SERPA1 and measured the cancer progression and observed significant change with SERPA knockdown. So the message here is that we used PyTeaser to identify non-canonical splicing regulatory code for metastatic cancers. This uh, pathway is orchestrated by SNRPA1 binding uh, structured motifs and changing the splicing patterns. Um, and that's about it for the application. So the conclusions uh, for my talk are that PyTeaser identifies RNA sector structure motifs it employs context-free grammars and mutual information that Hani emphasized in the introduction. And we use PyTeaser to identify STERPA1 as a non-canonical driver of metastasis. So with that, I would like to thank especially Hani, but also everyone in our lab for creating a very supportive environment. And I'm happy to take any questions. I will be talking about uh, using this concept of context-free grammar uh, for predicting RNA binding proteins by using neural networks. So uh, basically there has been quite a few me methods that uh, earlier Hani was uh, pointing at them. And uh, the contribution that we want to make uh, here is to uh, use uh, convolutional networks in, in a very specific way to capture uh, the context-free grammar and then provide it for the later uh, layers of the neural network to learn from them. So we have three aims uh, that uh, I'm summarizing the project and with them. Uh, initially, I will talk about uh, how we can use this specific type of uh, convolutional layers to make sure they can capture both sequence and a structure. Uh, and then once I've shown that, uh, I will uh, show uh, how, how this network is capable of learning uh, RNA binding protein binding sites uh, as obtained in vivo from CLIP experiments. And at the end, we will try to uh, dig into these and learn networks and see if we can uh, interpret them further. So uh, the name from the project comes from uh, this one version of this Greek mythology about Pythia, where she was the priestess at the uh, Oracle of Delphi. And uh, when she would go to this water spring to drink from it, uh, sometimes there was this Python that would show up and uh, come to this water uh, spring and start to communicate with Pythia. So when this communication was happening, Pythia would go to this ecstatic state and uh, she would uh, make this uh, unclear sounds. And uh, when the priest was passing by and uh, when the priest was hearing these uh, sounds that at the beginning they seemed uh, meaningless uh, sounds, uh, actually he was able to interpret them and find out that they were actually meaning uh, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And the analogy that I want to make here is that uh, the Python coming to the water spring is basically an RNA binding and RNA binding protein. And Pythia is our neural network, which is seeing this interaction and uh, is so amazed by it that it's it goes to this ecstatic state and learns all these millions of parameters. And of course, it's uh, it will be our job as the priest to really see what uh, these uh, millions of parameters mean by trying to interpret them. So uh, basically, I will go to aim one, uh, how we can use uh, convolutional uh, layers in a specific way to make sure they learn a structure. So uh, basically, let's start with this particular sequence that I have uh, made sure it represents a short uh, stem loop. All the bold sequence uh, nucleotides that you see perfectly base pair with each other, and we have this three nucleotide triple A in the middle. And if you want to design a convolutional filter and uh, that can capture a C and G that occur with three nucleotides from each other, that would be very similar to a convolutional layer that has uh, four input channels representing the four nucleotides, uh, one output channel. It has a kernel size of two, meaning that it sees two nucleotides at a time but also it has dilation of three, meaning that it will look into two nucleotides and it, while it's keeping three of them. So uh, with this concept, we can uh, define the weight. So for when C and G occur, a specific uh, number occurs and the other cases, uh, other values. And uh, we want to just take this one uh, C and G base pairing in this structure. So if we start by uh, shifting this filter uh, across the sequence and calculate the cross-correlation, uh, 
uh, it will produce different values at different uh, nucleotides. But when it gets to the occurrence of C and G, that is specifically three nucleotides apart, uh, it will produce its maximum value, which in this case is two. So this is like one convolutional filter with dilation of three. And we can uh, do this for all the other uh, dinucleotide base pairing that we are interested in. So for this specific sequence uh, here from left to right, I'm showing all the possible uh, base pairings that are, occur to, to make this perfect stem loop. And uh, you might think that, okay, and now that we know convolutional layers can learn this, why don't we just let the network to uh, learn them? And the idea is that uh, basically, if we want to have like one convolutional layer, we need to define what is going to be the dilation. And uh, if we can manually define these weights, we can uh, use zeros in a way that will reflect all the possible dilations. So instead of like passing the sequence multiple times through multiple dilation, you can do all of that in one pass. So for this specific sequence, I'm showing you how the output of these uh, manually uh, designed filters will look like if you have a perfect system loop. So at the center uh, of the left sequence where we have a perfect system loop, you see that the highest values align with each other. But if you permutate the right side of this sequence, uh, the structure becomes uh, different than the perfect system loop. And you will see the maximum values are uh, at different places and you are not capturing this, that specific uh, design. So here, basically the goal of the, this uh, manually uh, designed convolutional layer is to provide a context-free grammar. It's uh, not learning all of the structure. It provides these numbers and then it's up to the next layers of the neural network to map these to the uh, basically uh, objective function that we have at the end, whether it's a structure or a binding of a specific RNA binding protein. So to show you why we need, uh, we need to design this fixed dilated layer as opposed to passing the input sequence through all these different layers, I uh, did a toy experiment and I designed uh, this data set that uh, I'm going from the length of sequence that is 50 up to 1000. And I'm uh, engineering my uh, fixed dilated layer. So it's going to represent basically uh, dilations happening from four to 50. So I'm not even going to the full range of dilations, just a, a limited range of them. And you can see that the number of minutes that it takes on a GPU uh, to perform just one epoch, it's quite different when we apply this fixed data to layers versus when we uh, want the model to learn all these uh, basically weights by itself. And this is just one epoch. You can imagine for, uh, in a lot of cases, you would want to perform tens of epochs for your model to converge. So uh, to show that this context-free grammar is actually providing the enough information for learning some aspects of RNA structure. I'm using the um, minimum free energy uh, of uh, RNA sequences uh, as a surrogate of RNA structure. So my task here is to show that when I provide this input sequence to the network, uh, at the beginning, it goes through this fixed dilated convolution that its weights are fixed. It's defined by us uh, based on prior knowledge of base pairing and, and then this context-free grammar captured at, uh, at the fixed dilated layer is passed through uh, the other layers of the network so they can map it to a minimum free energy. So I did this for uh, a few different uh, lengths of sequences from again, 50 to 1000. And uh, on the top, I'm showing you how the loss was converging as we were performing uh, our uh, training and also how the Pearson correlation uh, of prediction versus uh, the uh, minimum free energy of folding was uh, looking like. So for the, uh, on the left that we have a length of only 50 base pair, it's an easier task, but as we get to the right where we have length of 1000, it's, it, it gets harder for the model to learn these patterns. And uh, you can see that, for example, at the beginning, in just a few epochs, uh, the model really converges. But on the right where we have like a long sequence, it takes a large number of epochs for the model to converge. But in all cases, uh, the model converges quite well. And at the end, you have uh, the same 
the same Pearson correlation on the uh, held out data set. So, so far, this was uh, just focusing on one task that this is capturing a structure. Uh, and what we want to do next is actually take this and bring it to the context of predicting in vivo RNA binding protein sets. So for that, so, uh, quick question. So, sure. so the minimum free energy that you used to is it is it from some um, some simulation or is it experimentally measured? It's uh, yes. So it uh, it's actually from um, one of the one of the uh, these uh, chemodynamic simulations uh, from VNRNA. It's not experimental data. Okay, and then uh, yeah, thank you. And then in, in the in sort of the fixed. The dilated convolutional layer in the beginning, like um, how many different sort of seeds, so to speak, are you are you including? Is it just like one type of structure, or like many many different structures? So basically, um, here uh, for the fixed dilated layer for this specific task, I was uh, using uh, the dilations that range from uh, two base per to. Uh, 96 base per, and uh, in, in the case that the sequence was longer than, of course, uh, 50 base per. So uh, I was doing, I was not going above like 96 in most cases. And uh, in addition to like dilate, fixed dilations, I was also including bulges. So meaning that if there's some asymmetry on one side uh, that frequently happens on uh, many RNA structures, it can also be captured. Okay, thank you. No problem. So uh, basically, so far, uh, we have some evidence that, uh, at least based on uh, chemodynamic simulations uh, of RNA, of that map and uh, identify like the best uh, folding for RNA, uh, Pythia, uh, or at least the version that I was showing you so far, was able to map sequence to, to its minimum free energy. And now we want to uh, make one modification and try to predict uh, try to see how Pythia can predict RNA binding proteins as determined by clip assays. So here uh, we made uh, another modification. So while the sequence is passing through this fixed dilated layer, it's also being passed through this uh, regular one-dimensional uh, convolutional field, convolutional layer. And the purpose for that is that uh, we already know that in addition to uh, a structure, uh, sequence is also important. So in some of the uh, previous slides that Matt, was, Matt and Hani were talking about, we know that even like some specific sequences in the loop part, uh, although they're not affecting a structure, uh, they're, they're quite important for uh, binding of RNA binding protein. So we have uh, one layer capturing context-free grammar of a structure and another layer capturing a sequence. And then all of these go through uh, next layers and uh, are con concatenated with each other. And at the end, they try to predict a given RNA binding protein profile in a binary classification task. So uh, here I'm showing you the data from one of these uh, RNA binding proteins, RBM6. And uh, I'm showing you uh, four different methods, basically. And uh, I'm showing you the receiver operating characteristic curve where it, where it uh, shows uh, false positive rate on the x-axis and the true positive rate on the y-axis. Uh, so first of all, this is basically uh, not the ideal way to show uh, binary classification tasks, specifically in genomic assays, where we have imbalance in the data. But we will start from here. And uh, the baseline uh, is this diagonal uh, dashed line. And if you take the uh, deep bind model that was uh, trained in 2015, and in vitro data, of course, we expect that it's not going to work on in vivo clip data that are uh, obtained in 2021. Uh, so if you want to fairly compare with DeepMind, it's better to retrain the model and see how it looks like. And also, uh, I use this other uh, model, GraphProt, uh, that uh, is using a support vector machine uh, and tries to include both sequence and structure uh, to learn RNA binding protein preferences. And again, with GraphProt, I retrained on the exact same data and uh, tested it out on the exact same data. And uh, here we see that Pythia is doing 6% better than a retrained deep bind, 
but on the uh, precision recall curve, which is a more uh, appropriate comparison, especially in uh, genomic uh, cases where uh, we uh, care really about precision. Uh, and here we see that there's a 21% improvement from Pythia to uh, deep retrain deep bind. So this is uh, not just one uh, RNA binding protein. If you look into this for, uh, through all the 43 RNA binding proteins that we tested, we uh, commonly see the same thing. So these plots that I'm showing you here, uh, the blue bar is showing area on the receiver operating characteristic curve, and the red bars uh, show the area on the precision recall curve. And Pythia, I'm highlighting it with purple. If there's graph plot uh, present, it's, it's with green. And retrain deep bind is specifically specified. And if it was uh, a deep bind model from uh, 2015, it's written uh, without the retrained uh, definition and, and it has the motif ID that was used. So- uh, Wait, I'm, I'm a little bit confused here, sorry. Uh, so so, so you, you, your neural network is only taking the, the, the RNA sequence and it's, it's predicting whether it's gonna bind you know, or not, right? Um, but it's not taking any representation of the protein that it's supposed to know whether it's binding to or not. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. So then how does it actually do anything meaningful on held out data? Because you would you know, naturally think that RNA protein binding is, 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 is heavily dependent on you know, the, you know, the epitopes on the protein and the you know, folded structure of the protein and whatnot, right? So, so basically that is our objective fu function. So based on some, uh, based on experimental data, we train the model in a supervised way so it sees how a given sequence map to uh, the binding profile of that specific RNA binding protein. It's not provided as an input, but is the in a basically supervised training task. It's the uh, output that is being trained on. Does that explain? Uh, no, not actually. So I, I guess my you know let, let's say you train your model on the first you know let's say you 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 hold out like RBM six as you have here. You train your model on everything else here, right? Um, oh, no, 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 the, 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 the held out is not RNA binding protein. So in each RNA binding protein, you're doing a classification task separately. So each of them has their own data set. Okay. And so the held out is not going between RNA binding proteins. It's within the RNA binding protein, you hold out sequences that are- Sequences, thank you, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically, uh, Pythia is generally performing uh, better, particularly when you look at the differences in the red bars, which is the area under precision recall curve. Uh, and one thing that I noticed, as you see, for example, in the case of uh, RBM5 happening here, is that uh, with the default parameters that we used, uh, basically the, the default deep point wasn't able to converge on this data. And with the, originally uh, for these models we used, uh, dilations going from two to uh, 48. And two of our RNA binding proteins, uh, D, uh, DDX5 and RBM42, even with Pythia, they weren't able to converge. But when we increase the dilation range for these two going from two to 96 instead of two to 48, then the model was able to converge and uh, provide the same type of uh, accuracy and generalizability. Meaning that it's really this dilation concept that is uh, really, and making an impact here. So, so far, uh, our Pythia model has this knowledge about uh, binding of uh, each RNA binding protein. So we have one model trained on each RBP. And now we want to obtain some wisdom from uh, this knowledge that Pythia has. So uh, here, uh, I want to show you like how this salience of these convolutionals look like. So what I did here was to perform uh, an in silico uh, deletion experiment, meaning that uh, once I measured the output of the convolution for a given sequence, so here each row is one uh, sequence. And uh, I started by removing 10 mers across uh, this 2056 mer. And uh, then I measured how the output of the convolution varies from the uh, deleted version versus the reference version. So on the regular 1D convolution, which is, which is capturing sequence, you see that always there's one part of the sequence that is really important and the other parts uh, have a more similar score. Meaning there's like this unimodal distribution 
uh, and the convolution is focusing on a specific part. And with the fixed dilated layer, which uh, its weights are predefined and fixed, uh, we are seeing this basically bimodal distribution. And it's uh, actually capturing uh, two major ranges of variations when we uh, basically uh, remove 10 mers from the sequence. So uh, I think this provides uh, basically a heterogeneity uh, for the model that it can use this uh, heterogeneity later as its context-free grammar and build upon it to uh, really learn about uh, RNA binding protein preferences. So to do it the proper way, I used um, two methods, uh, two model, uh, methods that are uh, developed by Anshul Kondaji's lab back to back. And the first one, deep lift, uh, is actually uh, you using, uh, quantifying the contribution from all of the nodes in the network. So instead of just looking at the uh, a specific layer, uh, and the weights of a specific layer, it's actually quantifying contribution from all neurons. And it's doing that uh, per nucleotide, per uh, sequence. And so we can obtain a set of uh, reference uh, based on the regions that bind a specific RBP and the set of basically a shuffled um, control and use it with TF Modisco, which is task is to obtain uh, a robust and non-redundant set of motifs from uh, these uh, importance scores. So I did this for uh, our set of RNA binding proteins. And once I used all of the uh, neurons from Pythia, uh, which is the green bars here. And I also did this once for the 1D regular convolution and once for the fixed dilated, dil uh, fixed dilated uh, convolution. And uh, here on the y-axis, uh, I'm showing you the number of motifs that we discover. Of course, uh, you, you would expect the motifs that come from all of Pythiol together to be more robust, uh, which is the case. Uh, but also here we are seeing the extent of um, heterogeneity that the fixed dilated layer is capturing and providing. So very high number of uh, non-redundant motifs that and then the later layers based on the non-linearity would decide to penalize or prioritize to uh, for a specific RNA binding protein. So I'm showing you here example from one of these um, RNA binding proteins, SFPQ, and uh, here are the all the motifs that we identified by using Pythia and DeepLeaf. So uh, here they are clustered based on uh, their similarity according to continuous jacket, and uh, although uh, they're expected to be non-redundant, but it's still uh, there are clear similarities. But uh, still, we can identify motifs from different clusters and compare them and see that there's a, a general heterogeneity that Pythia is capturing. So uh, some, of the, some of the parts of these motifs actually reflect what's been uh, discovered before. So Ray et al, basically they use in vitro assays um, to identify motifs for the RNA binding proteins. And actually, uh, in many cases, that we have the shams shared, shared RBPs, the more similarities, but also there's some new uh, information that is captured with this in vivo data. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, like in the old days, we would discover motifs from in vivo data, in vitro data, so we can use them to discover incidences in uh, basically in vivo. Uh, but now that we have this model trained for uh, in vivo data, we can actually use it for hypothesis generation in many cases. So one example could be any type of mutation that we want to see its effect in RNA binding protein uh, binding. So for example, if there's a polymorphism that uh, occurs in the same region that we see a clip peak, we can use Pythia to see how, at least based on the model, it varies uh, binding of that specific RNA binding protein by measuring the posterior of the model in the reference versus when we mutate the input. And I did this for all the uh, polymorphisms reported in the GWAS catalog from EBI. And all of these polymorphisms are basically annotated to be important to a specific phenotype or uh, disease. And uh, in some cases, I noticed there is this uh, large deviance in the uh, posterior of the motif. So we have uh, some instances where a single nucleotide change can uh, reduce the posterior of the model from 0 0.9 to 0 0.1. And uh, these are the two most common, uh, basically 
reference an altered allele that is seen in the population. And the other nucleotides that are not seen in the population in this specific case, for example, uh, they were actually not making that much of a change. So SNRPB specifically was quite interesting because when I, I was quantifying the different polymorphisms according to the, if the predicted effect that they have, I saw this quite high enrichment in splicing uh, polymorphisms. And SNRPB is in fact actually a, a splicing factor. So uh, I, for this specific case, SNRPB, I wanted to see if this is like something that you would expect by chance if you mutate like uh, this 256 MERS, would you expect to observe the same type of change or not? So I generated this null set based on mutating the same set of peaks that overlap uh, GWAS hits and uh, quantified how they change the posterior of the model. And here, the RBP set, which is on the y-axis, it's the uh, real uh, GWAS hits, you actually see they have much higher quantiles than a null, uh, meaning there's actually an enrichment in polymorphisms, uh, and this many of these effects seem to be uh, quite important. So uh, here, by discussing this, I want to uh, talk, talk about that uh, something like Pythia can have many applications in hypothesis generation. And it's not specific to just mutations in cancer or in uh, complex disease, but it can also be applied to infectious disease. So we already know that RNA binding proteins are quite important in life cycle, life cycle of many viruses. So here, this is a figure from uh, the Lee et al. Pa uh, paper uh, showing uh, the polyvirus cycle and the involvement of host RNA binding proteins. And there's this complex interaction happening between the host uh, RNA binding proteins, the viral uh, RNA binding proteins and proteases that are important for the viral RNA translation, viral RNA uh, switch from uh, translation to replication uh, and replication in general. So I, th I think with Pythia we, uh, and models like Pythia, we can uh, generate many hypotheses in many cases to uh, discover more about, the, more about the biology of RNA binding proteins. With that, uh, I want to summarize that basically with Pythia, with introducing uh, this fixed dilated convolution, uh, we can capture this uh, context-free grammar of RNA structure and a predict binding of RNA binding proteins with uh, good accuracy and precision. And we can use this for generating hypotheses in many cases. Uh, I would like to thank uh, my supervisor, uh, Hani, Hani uh, and uh, also the members of the Goodarzi lab and also my co-supervisor, uh, Dr. Bo Wang and his lab at Vector Institute. Uh, I will be happy to take uh, any questions.